What other funny cough stories have you got? You must have some funny cough stories. Your um, MGTF. Oh, oh, let's do another podcast on that one. Yeah. The MGF. That costs about two million pounds. The one that you crashed before my plane had even left the tarmac. In, in November All right. with the roof down. Another video coming up. Right then, this is a funny story. This is a story about an MGF known as Jeff. That's where the whole Jeff thing came from, from that car. Is that basically. where it came Pretty much, yeah. Jeff the MGF. Um, so I, I went travelling. And said to said to Jake, I'm never, ever, 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 ever coming back. But if I do ever come back because I've run out of money, keep this thousand pounds in a sock for me because I'm going to need it. <laughs> Two weeks later, <laughs> I was back. And uh, my our other brother, Nate, at the time, had bought an MGTF. And I'd never, I'd never been in one or had one. I'd never even thought to buy one. And uh, again, this was end of summer, so it was getting colder. And he takes me up, up the road in this TF and I'm like, I've seen the future. This is the best thing ever. Like, we're there, you know, woolly hats, roof off. So I go on eBay and find a little MGF freestyle that's for sale not far away, and it's 800 quid. So uh, I got I got mum to drive me up there. <laughs> mum took me up there, bought this little MGF, and it, and it was absolutely brilliant. And it was the first car that I ever painted the floors gold on. That's where the gold floor thing started as well. Um, so yeah, I did, did the floors gold on it, and it was, and it was brilliant. And then I think, why did I lend it to you? I don't know. I, I think I, I had a um, Suzuki Bandit at the time. Oh, yeah, that was it. Because I, I was working at working at Waitrose. You had your motorbike. Yeah, so I had a, had a motorbike. And then... That was if, it. If it was raining, I'd try and beg and borrow a car. But I got back from California, spent a little bit of time at home, during which I'd been watching Gas Monkey and Workaholics, and I'd convinced myself that I worked in a garage and I worked in a call centre, <laughs> but actually I was unemployed. Um, then I got a job, I got offered a job, and then immediately booked a holiday to Morocco. So I was like, oh sweet, I've got a job, so I'll, I'll have a holiday. So I, I flew to Morocco and lent you my car. But yeah. But I didn't know. <laughs> so I was, I think- was, Oh yeah, the plan was you were gonna pick me up from the airport. Yeah, that was why on the you way back car. You in said, my own car. I'll, I'll lend you the car for a week, pick me up when I get back. Yeah. So I borrowed the car, it was probably Saturday morning, I was driving to work, it was November, it was probably about three degrees, I had the roof off, driving through Birmingham, I was probably playing some awful music quite loud, and I went, I was going down this road, there's cars, cars parked on either side of the road, I went round this corner at a moderate speed, I wasn't gunning it, and the back just went, and then the back was going from left to right, left to right, all over the place, and there was cars parked on either side of the road, um, I'm not sure how insured I was, without incriminating myself, I definitely wasn't <laughs> fully comp. I was somewhere between third party and completely uninsured. Um, so yeah. I had to choose between a big curb and a tree, or hitting another car. And I thought if I hit the tree, I'm only going to damage myself, so I hit the tree. Up the curb, into the tree, and the I only had to drive another 100 metres to pull into the Waitrose car park, so I was driving along had the steering wheel at about a 90 degree angle and that was going in a straight line. At which point, my plane hadn't yet left the tarmac and yeah. I didn't know. So, so I, I rang a mate and said, what shall I do? And I managed, he said, just wait, just go to work, clear your head a bit, try and limp it home. If you can't get it home, we'll deal with it. Um, so I limped it home, took it to a garage and they, I think, charged me about 800 pounds to fix it. So I paid yeah, the 800 was, pounds to fix it. That and thought, I'll get the car fixed. He does, yeah, he doesn't need to know about it. He doesn't need to know that I've crashed it. But then I think it took them about 10 days to fix it, so I couldn't pick you up from the airport. So at the point when I text you and said, you're right to pick me up from the airport, you you simply text back and said, I haven't got a car. Which, <laughs> which I thought was a bit weird, because you had my car. So then me being me, I was then on the plane coming back from Morocco being like, and I was landing at like half past 11 on the night with no lift and nothing arranged. So as the plane landed, right, the tyres screeched, I stood up at the back and went, can anyone give me a lift back to Birmingham? Which is not something that you do on a plane. <laughs> so everyone's just staring at me like, what is this mentalist doing? I think I was wearing a Patek Philippe, an Amiga, a Rolex, and a tea cosy hat from, from the souk in Marrakesh. 
Then I had to go and get like a mega bus, and I basically ended up at this dodgy train station. I, I don't even know how I got home or what time it was when I got home, but it was the next day that I found out that you'd crashed the car. And I think at, at the time I was probably on minimum wage. I was living at home. I was broke. Yeah. And so spending nearly a thousand pounds to fix a car that wasn't mine was not ideal. It was also not fixed. No, it was, yeah. It was still, so So what happened then was... It was um, a standard, you take a car to a garage and say, can you fix it? And they say and yes like, without actually thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, so they throw a few parts at it without working out what's actually wrong with it. We should have written it off at that point, but because of the way everything had happened, we didn't. So then I found an MG specialist in Wolverhampton and took the car to them. And to be fair, although I got a decent sized bill, they set the car up properly and they set all the suspension up and they did everything and when i drove away from there the car was totally transformed i was about three grand into a 500 pound car by that <laughs> <It> point was. <laughs> i was about a grand in it i didn't even own it <laughs> so i then enjoyed that car for the rest of that winter and i would drive it everywhere with the roof off <laughs> technique of accelerating away from a traffic light and then flicking the roof off when you got to about 30 mile an hour which is great until I broke the roof um, but no that car was absolutely brilliant and then with my girlfriend at the time we were going to do a little driving tour around Cornwall and about a week before we were going I was in a very bad mood and I was trying to drift around a roundabout in Birmingham and managed to slide the back wheel directly into the central reservation and yeah then it got picked up on a lorry and taken to a garage, and I said, can you fix this? <laughs> and they said, yeah, we can fix that. I spent 600 pounds, and it was not fixed. <laughs> <laughs> so they did, they did the tracking, they, they fixed it, and they did the tracking, and then they pulled it out into the yard, and I looked at it and was like, no, that wheel should not be sat like that. Uh, so I sold it for 250 pounds, and we went on the Cornwall trip in my girlfriend's Fiesta instead. YouTube's most boring car channel.